Hello, everybody, and welcome to a great um, LinkedIn Live. Excited today to have with us all the way from Boston, Professor Yossi Sheffi. Um, um, well, for those of you who don't yet know Professor Sheffi, um, he's one of my, definitely one of my favorite people in, in logistics and supply chain. He's a professor at MIT. Um, he's also the director of the Center for Logistics and Transportation at MIT. He's written a lot of books. He's been one of the leaders in the field, really, at educating and sharing um, with the general population, like myself included, about the wonders and uh, uh, of, of supply chain and logistics. And today we are here to share about his latest book, uh, which I have here with me, The Magic uh, Conveyor Belt, um, Supply Chains, AI, and the Future of Work. And um, and I'm sure it's going to be a super insightful discussion. So, Professor Yossi, thanks for joining. Welcome. Thank you very much, Radu. Nice to be with you. Um, and as we were sharing a little bit before before we went live, I've actually read the book. It it uh, it's a it's an easy read, but at the same time a fascinating read. It goes through the history of, of you know supply chains in general. A lot of insightful examples. Um, I I very much found it uh, useful and. Um, I read it with pleasure and recommended it. Now, I want to first zero in and ask you, why did you call it the magic? So you called it the magic conveyor belt. So why is it magic, Professor? Well, I should start by why did I, wrote, why did I write the book? And this is, uh, you know, after the pandemic, a lot of people around the world discovered that supply chain is there. It's really what brings them food and medicine and clothes and ev everything that makes life worthwhile. So uh, this is the discovery lately, and they some they knew that I'm working in this area, friends and neighbors, and I see what what is supply chain? Tell us now. Now that we understand, everybody said that we have supply chain problem. What is supply chain? What's going on? So the first part of the book is actually starting trying to to explain to people the complexity, the the what's involved in this massive global network spanning the globe and. As I said, at one point in the book, I said, you should never be angry that something on Amazon warehouse on the shelf of the supermarket, the shelf of store is not there. You actually be totally surprised and wow that it's still there. Because if you understand what it takes to bring a product from the mine to hundreds of people and thousands of people involved in it to your shelf, then you'll be amazed that it's there. That's why I call it the magic conveyor belt, the, 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 the conveyor belt that brings the stuff from the mine or from the field to your supermarket shelf. That was the, uh, the nature. And then the book went about talking about the technology and supply chain and, and people's jobs and all of this. But, but it all started from explaining what supply chains are and why, why they're so complex, why they're so uh, amazing that it works. And, uh, at one point in the book, I said, once you understand how big and complex and how many people and organizations involved in this, and then the millions, you know, you start understanding that it's magic, that there's no Uber Lord, there's no czar that makes it all happen. It happens by itself. It's the Adam Smith hand. It's, it's, uh, that's what makes it work. It's pairs of buyer-seller, 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 buyer-seller that work along the supply chain, and it works. So <laughs> without yeah. anybody organizing it. That's the magic. Hmm. So rightfully said. And I, I also remember you gave an example in the book when uh, I think you were saying your wife, perhaps, if I remember oh, correctly, yes. <laughs> went to the supermarket and then the, the young teller there told her, well, sorry, we don't have product X because we have supply chain issues. And that's when your yeah. wife felt that finally people understood or at least <laughs> talked about what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because these are people always ask my wife what I do. She said he's doing research in supply chain management. Ask what what is it? And then she said, <laughs> you know, the few months after the pandemic started, she had this incident in the supermarket and she came back to me and said, now everybody knows about supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> now I can be proud. Um, I want to 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 ask you. So there's a lot of questions that I have prepared. I want to ask you specifically what you mentioned about building upon the the magic of the conveyor belt, yeah, and all these interconnected supply chains, which ultimately are are networks of of people. And you gave a, a lot of uh, really interesting examples in the book. And maybe I'll ask you to share 
one or two that, that you prefer. I mean, you were talking from, you know, a car that has thousands and thousands of parts. Now, for those parts to come together in a way that actually make the car is beyond magic. It's, it's you know, and, and to get all those people synchronized to produce it and to assemble it and to get all the parts at the right time. And you, you, you gave a few more examples. So maybe just let's take one of those examples, whichever you prefer, to illustrate right, the I'll, kit. I'll start with the one you mentioned, the car, because the... You know, people buy cars and they look at, uh, you know, what the seats are, how the the navigation system works, how it drives, how it accelerates. But they have no clue what it takes to build one, what it takes to make one. And it's um, average cars, as, as I mentioned, is about 30,000 parts. And um, but companies have a hard time managing 30,000 parts. So men manage it in tiers. And I explain a small example that I, that I give there is how to build a toy car. Just to give the level, how many stages are involved in making a little toy car. And it's nothing like a Ford Motor Company is about 1,800 or 2,000 direct suppliers. That's one they pay. Each one of them has dozens and hundreds of their suppliers, those of sub suppliers, sub suppliers, sub suppliers. This is the network that kind of spans the globe. So I tried, first of all, to give an idea that how, how many parts involved, how many processes are involved. And I decided at one point, continue with the car. I look at one, um, one example of the, of the catalytic converter and how many parts just the catalytic converter is made of. And then it goes to, to under the car and where it's done, it goes around the world several times. It's painted the special paint in one, in one part of the world. And then, and then it goes to another part. And the paint is manufactured in Germany and applied uh, you know, uh, in Ecuador. And, and it goes back. Just to understand what it takes to get that a lot of companies are specializing in, in certain parts, just to explain what it takes. But then I so said, yeah, people may accept the fact that car has 30,000 parts, that an aircraft maybe has a, has a million parts. But just give the example that the diaper, a diaper has about 50 parts. That all, it, it's just, an, and it's a, actually a very, you know, uh, technology laden product, just how all the layers and how it's done, it's work just right. And just to give the length of the supply chain, I follow the, uh, one banana. And, 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 and banana is an easy product because it comes with its own packaging. I mean, it's not, and, and uh, so just, and, and not even you know growing the banana, just from the uh, field in Costa Rica until it gets into the United States, how many stages are involved, how many people are involved, how complex it, and the fact that like many other food that people don't realize, very few of these are actually, you know, don't involve technology. Aside from technology of the ships and the truck and everything, that just banana goes into ripening rooms. And when they come to the uh, warehouse of the, either of the retailer of the uh, you know, distributor, and then when the retailer order, they want to order bananas that are, some of these are, some of them are yellow, some of them are half yellow, half green, some of them are green. They want, so the, uh, in the warehouses, they have certain chambers when they put certain gas into it, they whiten the banana in a certain stage. So exactly when the retailer order it to the shop, it comes with the structure that they actually want. So it's very much a technological product at the end. Uh, even though it's just a banana. So just to, to understand in every process, every product that you touch, everything goes through so many processes on the way, and it works. So as I said, you should be amazed when it works, and you should yeah. go and thank every supply chain manager out there that it makes it work. So that's the idea. Agreed. And I'll, I'll jump a little bit towards more the the part of technology, and then you you, you start speaking about artificial intelligence, and and this is obviously it's blown up in the last um, in the last months. Yeah, we've seen ChatGPT. You also talk about ChatGPT in the book and what it says they can do. So I want to open a little little bit on the process because you're one of the. I mean, I'm not so sure that any of us knows how exactly this is going to play out. But you're one of those people that I think are closest to potentially knowing how this is going to play out. Yeah. So I got a lot of questions from my friend. They said, make sure you ask Professor <laughs> Professor Sheffi, how does this whole artificial intelligence, how is it going to play out specifically in logistics and supply chain? How is it going to make work easier or harder? How do you see it? 
Okay, so that's a you know important question, of course, and and people are anxious about it. Of course, people are anxious about the job losses. People are anxious about change. People are anxious about what what will happen next. The uncertainty makes people very anxious and 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 worried. In fact, the uh, aside, I was talking to uh, somebody from uh, CNBC. You know, a, a, an interview from from CNBC, and she said. Professor Sheffi, I'm now on a ledge. I just, I, I'm ready to jump. I'm so worried about my job. What will happen? I'm, I'm, you know, 48 years old. I cannot, I don't know technology. What do I have to start programming computers? I don't know. And first of all, get off a ledge, get a cup of tea and let's talk. I mean, <laughs> you know, people, people are actually worried. Uh, I, I, and, and I understand this. So how, how is it going to play? There's a, there's a large part of the book is talking about it. So first of all, I don't think it will be bad. I just don't. It's, I'm very optimistic about it. There are lots of reasons why there are, you know, people, let me get back and see. There are people and good people, I'm talking about Bill Gates, Elon Musk, who are worried about it. I don't share it. And there are, of course, people on the other side who think it's uh, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, uh, you know, people in the in the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, and I think you know it's Nirvana. It's the new you know golden age is coming. So there are you know smart people on all sides who have very different point of view. I'm more in the middle, uh, but I'm not worried. I'm I'm, I'm optimistic. It's clearly a, a new tool. Take Chat ChatGPT for example. So ChatGPT is uh, something that uh, people in universities are worried about. You know, oh my God, my students are writing article chat GBT. What will happen? How how can we be able to tell? And I say, what do you care? Do you care when your students use a spreadsheet to solve a problem? No, you don't. It's just a tool. So what you have to do now is teach them how to use it well, how to do the queries, and most importantly, how to monitor the results. Because some of the results are stupid. Some of them is what we call hallucination. It just makes the stuff from from that, which bring me to another issue, some of the new jobs that will come in the new, call it the chat GPT economy or whatever you want to call it, AI infused economy, will be monitoring. And that's a tough job. And we have to rethink how to do it because monitoring is boring. You have to monitor a process that you don't do every, uh, all the time, but you have to keep the knowledge, you have to keep the experience to know when it goes wrong. That's a very tough job, and we'll have to have a psychologist and uh, you know HR people thinking about how to make this job, you know, work. Example: If you drive a Cadillac City Six, it has a, a drive by itself. You can you can put it in uh, auto mode; it goes by itself. You don't have to touch it. But what it has, because they are worried about you just falling asleep and not or just not paying attention. The minute that you, it has a camera that look at your eyes, the minute that you take your eyes off the road, so first of all, the uh, steering will start shaking. And then a few seconds later, if you don't do anything, the car goes to the side and stops. That's an example of the AI monitoring the guy who monitors the AI. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yes, making sure that the monitoring is there. And there are other ways to keep you, to ask you to do certain tasks all, all the time. Airplane pilots, you know, air, today modern airline, airliner is a drone. It can go from gate to gate with nobody do, doing anything. But instead of the automatic, uh, automatic communication, you know, the airplane can send text messages to the tower and back and operate them, it's not a problem. But no, the pilots have to communicate. Because the pilot have to be there. You give the pilot a job, because it, it, he has to do the communication. He has to. So, a lot of it is just understanding how to do it. And then, one more thing about the thing: we actually, as I said, there are various point of view, and we don't know. We don't. The truth is, as, as Niels Bohr once said, it's very hard to predict, especially the future. So it's you know. Uh, it's future, it's new technology. It's uh, So you try to get some reference point. And I, in, in the book, I try to look at all the industrial revolutions and what happened. And in every one of them, a few jobs were lost, many jobs were changed, but mostly a lot more jobs were created than lost. 
So it's true that some jobs don't exist anymore. We don't have, you know, telephone exchange operators, you know, that put the plug mm -hmm. in, the, in the exchange and connect it. We don't have elevator operators. You know, in 1945, there were 15,000 elevator operators in New York. They went on a strike and New York came to a grinding halt. People were afraid to go to the elevator by themselves without an operator, even though the operator, if you recall, had something that they move right and left to go up and down. That's it. It was not complicated to operate, but people didn't want to do it without the... So there's AI, it's also, the, of course, the, everything is a question of acceptability. What do you accept? What, you don't, uh, what society accepts? And we can talk more about this. But um, so some jobs are lost, but many more jobs are, are being created. And one of the things that the AI is doing now, why the fear? The fear is among the, I would say, educated people. That as, yes. long, as long as, uh, you know, technology and AI took the jobs of people on the assembly line, eh, who, who cares? It's them, not us. Now it's coming for us. It's coming for teacher and lawyers and an accountant and you know. And if you, first of all, it will make your job better because it will, every job has parts that are drudgery and just routine. And this, every technology will make at the end will get those better because it will do a repeated job with no errors or very very few errors as long as you can monitor it and make sure that you have the job and then people will concentrate on the more creative part of the job, job uh, things require thinking, think, things that, uh, that change. But I, by and large, don't see significant job losses in, in there. And by the way, some, there'll be some because of the scale. If you'll be better and it's the same amount of work, you need less people. But the truth is you'll do more work. There'll be more stuff going out. Unfortunately, in the US, more lawsuits. So it's <laughs> because it's so easy now to, to, to fight because the AI can do, uh, can do a lot of the work. Even worse, briefs will have, that used to be three pages long because you had to write them, now it'll be a thousand pages long because you know, <laughs> AI is writing it. So, so, so we will see some changes. Nobody wants to read, so it'll be, there'll be restrictions. And by the way, you see a lot of it already. If you ask ChatGPT now how to build a Molotov cocktail, you will not get an answer because they put guardrails on, 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 on certain questions. So people will guard less on this. It's not going to be, you know, bad. You're not going to get, you're not going to have to read thousand pages email every morning. Uh, so society will, will adjust, uh, adjust to this. Anyway, we can talk a lot more about it. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to. Yeah, so I have, I actually have, and, and I want to, so I'll take a quick, I love, I love the, the, the prelude. Yeah. How you said the, the, the scene. I also love your positive. I mean, you, the fact that you, you lay down, let's, let's not jump on off the ledge uh, yet. Uh, let's, let's take a breather let's and drink a coffee. off the ledge, period. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a permanent solution to a, to a temporary problem. Uh, um, I want to encourage everybody watching this. Yeah, there's there's quite a few a few people watching this. Post your questions in the comments. Yeah, so we will I will be taking questions for Professor Sheffi. Now I want to comment a little bit on what you said with the people being the ones monitoring the process. Yeah, so the AI will be um, obviously being able to compute way more information. They will be able to. Uh, to data crunch at the same time they might take some stupid decisions at some point because there's some there's some deviation that only a human they don't have context and i love what what you actually gave as an example in the book context is important and i, I actually specifically love that example that you gave with the two publishing houses yeah that one i forget the example. name yeah that... for example it is it was a case yes yeah so maybe you, maybe you tell the example because it's a good example yeah just to let people what what the example is. So there have been two book publishers who published some book in biology, some you know really not not a not a bestseller book. That, you know, three people have to read because they do research in the area. So they the one one of them was a premium seller, and one of them was a you know discount seller. And the premium seller wanted always to be a little bit higher than the discount seller. And the discount seller want to be just a little bit lower. So what happened is 
the uh, one of them started, let's say the uh, the premium. So so they start with the same price. The premium said, "Well, that's not that's ridiculous," and raise its price. So the you know the discount say, "Okay, I want to be just below." So the premium said, "That's that's not enough," and, and went higher. And the discount say, "Okay, I want to be just below." They went like this. At the end of the you know after a very short while because it's done by algorithm. After a very short time, the time. Both books on this seller were selling for about $23 million. Um, and uh, at the same time, of course, other seller were selling it for $3.50. So it's uh, on Amazon. So that's an example and, and until somebody at Amazon realized what's going on and, 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 and stopped it. But it, it was for a while, for several days. The, the book was, was there for $23 million. So that's an example of context. I mean, Think about what, what's going on around you. you. You sell a book for $23 million, others are selling it for $3.50 or $30, whatever. I mean, a reasonable price, uh, price for a book. But that's an example of stupidity of algorithm. They, they're not stupid. They do what they are programmed to do. You know, they, they, um, the idea was, I want to keep that much above, above the, the discount competitor. Discount competitor, I want to be just below that guy and keep moving, 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 moving automatically. So when automatic system, they actually did exactly what they're designed to do. It's just in no context. You know? So they went haywire. Correct. And I, I, I've seen a um, um, high paying job. It was a joke, but anyways, it was a high paying job. Um, the title was something to the extent we need a bucket of water uh, expert. 400,000 US dollars uh, per annum, the, it was advertised as under open AI. Um, and under the job description, there were just very few tasks. Number one, somebody that can pay attention for long periods of time with only one focus it can be very boring. And then the second line was somebody that can, if we, we shout the, the word danger, danger, picks up a bucket of water and throws it on the server. And the third one was if they can also set it on fire, <laughs> it's a it's an advantage. So, you know, it was a joke to say that, you know, we need a person to switch off the machine if this machine turns on against us <laughs> and if AI goes rogue <laughs> or goes the same. Way, and I... No, but then we, you said something something very important because one safety device that we need to put in this system is an off switch, just the ability to switch it off. If these things start, you know, people are saying, oh, it will start destroying humanity. Make sure there's an off switch. On, you know, that's all. It doesn't take a lot more than that. So as I'm, I'm actually, uh, yeah, there are challenges along the way. And, uh, but we see actually the fact that some people in the low middle class may be doing better because it will be very hard to replace your, you know, electrician or plumber to come to the home and do something because it's so different. Everything is, is different. Uh, it may be a lot easier to replace a professor. So it's a, <laughs> but then there's also, I should say, there's, there's so many hurdles on the way. I gave before the example of the, uh, there's something I didn't mention in the book, but I gave the example of the, Telephone exchange operators that used to put the plugs in on this. The um, the automatic exchange was invented in 1892. Uh, by 1950, there were 350,000 telephone operators. Only at the end of the 1980s, the job was eliminated. It took nine decades to actually. So it's not happening fast. Part of it is a uh, is the fact that, and, and there are, okay, before I even, even go there, just another example that uh, actually this one is, is in the book, that ATMs, you know, when ATMs came out, automatic teller machine, people said, okay, there will be no more tellers. Well, there's one fly in the ointment, in the, uh, in the ointment. We are now about four decades after, no, three or four decades after the introduction, the wide world spread introduction of ATM, and there are more than twice as many tellers as there were before ATM. How, how, how can this be? Well, there are other forces of work, in, in, at work. 
with a lot of uh, automatic tellers, the price of have, the, the cost of opening a bank branch went down significantly. So many more branches are open. And in every street that you see, at least in the United States, I haven't checked lately in, in, in Germany or Singapore, but every street, as it says, every third you know, shop on, 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 uh, on Main Street, or High Street, is a bank. I mean, there are so many banks, that's why, because it became a lot less expensive to open a bank. So that's one, one effect. There's also another effect of creating jobs. And this is, I give the example of the Ford assembly line. The Ford assembly line de-skilled many jobs. It used to be artisans, really, building cars and go one car at a time. The assembly line came, and the jobs became a lot simpler. You just do this cog along the line. The number of workers in Ford increased significantly from about uh, uh, 700 to 150,000 at the height of the Model T. But this was not the main, that's why it's so hard to predict what will happen to jobs. The main effect was that car became cheaper. The United States and then all over the world, people develop highway, hotel, motels, restaurants, millions of people employed in the hospitality industry. So, and this was because cars became cheaper because we invented the assembly line. So yeah, the number of workers in Ford went up somewhat, but the big was in, in adjacent, in not, not the main area when technology came in, but the effect of this were widespread. And there are several other examples in the book. And that's why there'll be no industries that are hard to predict now. What will mm. they be? Will the jobs will be in, in, in this new industry? What will be the job description of, of you know, in, in this new It's hard to predict, but, you know, everything that we know about history says that there will be no industry and no jobs whenever there's a technological upheaval, ever technological improvement. So I, I, it's hard for me to, to say this time is different. Uh, why? Uh, I don't see why. So, so let me let me play... A little bit devil advocate. Let, let me play the negative for a second. So I was actually on the on the plane coming. So I'm now in Munich. Uh, as I was sharing with you, I, I I was on the plane. I was sitting next to a lawyer. She hadn't really played with ChatGPT, um, but I I told her a little bit about it. She had heard about it. She's been about ten years within the a law firm, which as as many of us know, law firms are you know you start at eight, you finish at God knows, and you grind that for about 15 years, and then they maybe, luckily, they make your partner, and then you make a lot of money, and then you're. <laughs> sure. Um, but the point is that those 15 years are almost years in in which you just learn context and you learn, you know, how the, the magic of, of skill. Now, whether it is law, whether it is programming, yeah. So let's take programming. ChatGPT is very good at, at programming, summarizing, coding, looking for errors. Now, again, if you're a very good coder, and I've seen not numerous examples of this, you will spot mistakes and you will see where it goes wrong. But your work increases it dramatically in efficiency. Here's, however, the catch in my mind. Yes, yeah? so I'm throwing the the easy questions to you, yeah, Professor. <laughs> As always. So in my in my yeah, in my mind, that zero to five, random exam, zero to four years of experience, zero to five years of experience, specifically mostly in white collar jobs, as you said, it's not the electricians or the plumbers to be worried about this. It's, you know, I don't know, the accountants and the lawyers and the coders and the program. Zero to four years of experience, you don't really add a lot of value because you're learning. Now, ChatGPT already can do most of the stuff better than whoever is just entering from university, starting. So I guess my question is, how, what will happen to, you know, you, you're, you're teaching, uh, you know, you have a lot of students at, at MIT. What will happen? How will they acquire that zero to four, five, six years of experience? It's, 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 a, it's a good question. Uh, excellent question. I touched it in, in my book and said this is one of the main problems. Because if I say that some of the new jobs will involve a lot of monitoring, I mean, working with the technology, but also monitoring the technology. You cannot monitor the technology if you just come off of university because you don't know actually much. You don't know about the, the company, how it works, all the everything around the company, the ecosystem. It's very hard to make judgments at this point. You don't understand the context of what the company operates. So we need people with actually, let's call it five years experience. How do you hire people with five years experience? That's that's very hard because assuming that the the AI can do all the simple jobs that, uh, that people 
that's a real question. And I, uh, I offer a few solutions in the, uh, in the book. First of all, I mentioned that uh, it's, and there are also the, in addition to the question of uh, upscaling of, of, of existing work here to be able to, to understand. The upscaling is uh, maybe a somewhat easier issue, easier, but uh, there are so many opportunity to learn by yourself online today mm -hmm. that there's no justification for you not taking your future in your hand and upgrading yourself. If your company does, some companies do it, by the way, lots of companies actually do it. I mean, UPS is known. You are not going to be everybody who, until the last CEO, everybody at UPS started as other moving boxes or driving trucks. You know, then you became CEO. They're always promoting within and sending to school and educating. So there are many companies that do, they, they, they continue upscaling. But at the end of the day, telling everybody it's your responsibility. You have to keep with it, upgrade yourself. Now go to the process, and uh, there are two solutions for the for the people just just off school. One of them is the instant instruction. I no, I don't know. What to call it? You are a warehouse worker, and you wear, you know, augmented reality glasses. You don't need to understand how everything works because in the glass it shows you go there, pick these packages, and that's what in these packages requires special handling, and it goes there. So it's task based, just for the next task, what to do. So it, it, technology helps there. So you start doing it after a while, you realize what's going on, you get experience. Another thing, I point to the German dual education system. So the United States should think seriously about this. The in the German system, 52-55% uh, of German high schoolers don't go to university. They apply to a company, and the company connects them with a local university, and they do three or four years, half time at the university, half time at the company. So basically do internship while they're uh, Learning. It, it, it's actually a cooperation between the German government, the companies, and the universities. The German government defined 350 something jobs, and this is ah, it, it gives, it, it helps with the, you know, money and all of this. But the, and when people think, 70 percent of them are then hired by the company where they were doing internship because they now have experience, they know the theory, they are. So I, I, I suggested the United States should think about a system like this. Uh, because the system in the United States, in many ways, you know, specifically in the United States, is broken. Because not only, well, system in a lot of places is broken, but spe especially in the United States, because what is so atrocious in the United States is the high cost of college. And so people finish colleges with debts that they'll be carrying for 20, 30 years. And it, it, it means that they cannot start families on time, they cannot buy houses. It impacts the economy. So, of course, it's different. You get a, a computer science degree from MIT. Okay, you're, you're going to do fine. Or for Stanford, or for Carnegie Mellon. You're going to do fine. But very few people do it. I mean, most people get, a lot of people get degrees, just go to university and get degrees that do not offer job opportunities. Uh, so I suggest that, first of all, the funny coming from a university professor, but I firmly believe that too, in the United States, too many people go to college. Uh, they don't need to. There are lots of uh, trade schools, lots of, um, and I, look, it, it gets personal. I had this uh, disagreement, this um, argument with my granddaughter. My granddaughter is 18. She's going to call it next year. I tried to tell her, why? Don't. If it's coming to me, don't. Go try to think what do you want to do with your life and study that. And then, then you want to take a courses in uh, you know ancient history, do it online. There are so many courses, you do whatever you want. Uh, but there's social pressure. Her peers go to college, you go to all her friends. So she's going to college. And it's uh, because peer pressure, you know, uh, cultural, it, it, it's just kind of expected at, at, at her. You know, her community, all her friends are doing. So it's, there's a, you know, part of a culture here that's kind of hard to, uh, hard to change. But this, I'm, I'm, I'm calling for you. It's uh, because you're right. The problem are with startup jobs. How, because those jobs are going to be automated. 
whether it's a lawyer that does the, you know, associate who do all the grunt work, the grunt work can now be done better and faster by AI. And you need a few people, a few, you know, experienced lawyers who will go over it, but their productivity will be so much higher now. That they yeah. Because by the way, they had to go over what the associates were doing anyway. I mean, because yes. it's <laughs> They are the one who go to court and have to have to argue the case, but the associate will learn it. So we have to have a, a companies may have to realize that they have to, you know, hire maybe smaller number of people, but grow them. Just part part of the cost uh, part of the cost of being. By the way, the same way that a plumber again, I don't know the rules uh, in Europe or in Singapore. In the United States, you want to be a plumber, you need a license. And the license is not only if you go to school, you learn what to do. You have to work for five years with a, with a, 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 a licensed plumber. Five mm -hmm. years have to work before you can have you can be a licensed plumber. So it's internship. You learn by yes. helping helping somebody who is a, who is a licensed plumber, and uh, and plumbers make so much money that they need you for them to hire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> Just, just my plan in Boston drive a Bentley. Just to give you an idea of what, <laughs> what, what you do. I don't drive a Bentley. <laughs> I love, love, love the love the example. Um, so uh, I'll continue a little bit with the with the nuance. So, and you mentioned you mentioned a little bit, uh, and I, I'd love then to to park also the topic of education, and I'll come back to that and, and how you see that because I love your opinion on education in the future. Now. Um, you mentioned the example with the interconnecting the switchers that it, it took quite a few decades before they were all uh, or they were disruptive. Yes. What I feel is different, and I, I obviously didn't believe those times, but what I feel right now is different. You know, we have a very good question. I'll read it, I'll read it to you from Steve. The velocity, the speed. <laughs> I mean, ChatGPT, the thing got a million users within a week. Like, <laughs> I mean, okay, from there to actually using it with purpose, with efficiency, of course, there's a gap. But just, you know, we're seeing this acceleration of adoption that we've never been seen before. Yeah, so it's it, it took, it used to take a bit longer. Now it takes all of a sudden quite fast. I mean, if I look at my daughter, nine years old, I mean, I don't think she cares that much if, if she gets the summary of something from a, you know, from ChatGPT or from an actual professor at school anymore. So I think kids, they are open slate, like you were talking about your granddaughter, yeah? Because she already has the cultural peer pressure, but the younger they are, they don't have that necessarily. Yeah. So that's that's the question. I'll read you the question because it's a good question from Steve. He says, um, how to transition the workforce with minimal disruption? Because his point is when we convert, you know, it, it was easy to teach a horse rider to drive a car. Or a forklift. It was easier than converting a forklift operator now, which okay can be augmented with AI, but converting that forklift operator to a knowledge worker, configuring AI models to run a warehouse, is quite a different complexity of a task. So that's that's a little bit the nuance here or the question <laughs> how to do it. So let me first of all several answers for this. First of all, a I'm less worried about converting the, the warehouse worker because uh, the warehouse worker knows how to run an iPad. And this will be as easy as running an iPad because the user interface now are becoming so easy to use that uh, I, this is not gonna be uh, not gonna be an issue because it, it's like working with a joystick or working with uh, you know iPad. Uh, you, you can make the robot do whatever you want. So this, I, I'm less, less worried about this. But let me agree with him. The, Steve, you said his name? Um, that the, I, made, I made a point in the book that in previous industrial revolution, there were involved a lot of uh, physical objects. So when steam came about, you have to change how warehouses were you know, laid out. You have to build steam engines. You have, and it's all physics. It's all, you know, hardware and it takes time to do. And it takes time. Today, you develop a new algorithm and in the press of a button, it's all over the internet. It's everywhere. You don't need to, because it's, it's software. And people already have the hardware that they need. They, they, they don't even need the hardware because there's clouds and somebody has and Google and Amazon, you know, AWS and, and, and Azure. 
they have the hardware already. So you don't even need, need the hardware. So it, it goes it, it goes fast. Uh, I acknowledge this 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 is the case. It goes fast, but but there's another several reasons why it goes slow, why it's not going to be as fast as PPP. First of all, by the way, some AI there we don't even realize it. When you you know when you open your uh, iPhone and it looks at your face, it is an AI program that looks at your face and decides that it's you. Looks at a lot of stuff. So there are, there are you know many many AI program, you know the robots that are running in warehouses, uh, autonomous vehicles. It's all it's all AI. Uh, so it it's there. It you know AI um, is there already. So a uh, but when we talk about some of the tasks we're talking about with the new generative AI, not gonna work as fast as people think, even though the algorithm can spread because there's several other issues. First of all, acceptability by society. So we start going back to the air, to my airline there, you know, examples. You know, as the airplane can go from gate to gate, nobody that. Would any of your audience go on an airplane that no, we had no pilots? Nobody in the in the cockpit. In fact, there's no cockpit. Uh, just an aluminum tube with nothing in it. Maybe some screens so that you can watch what you're doing and play games. But that's about it. Mm, my guess is uh, the percentage out of your audience who will do it is exactly zero. I mean, nobody will go on an airplane without a pilot. Would you feel comfortable when autonomous or trailer without a truck, without a driver, are going behind you on a highway at uh, you know 100 kilometers an hour? Maybe, not so fast, not so fast. So first of all, there's societal acceptance in, in this, and you just wait until autonomous trucks in the first accident, and there'll be a you know outcry, and, and just remember. Or maybe you don't remember it. I, even I don't remember it. But the, when the first cars came about in Chicago, when the first they, they introduced to the road, there used to be a person with a flag walking ahead of the car to alert the pedestrian that the car is coming. I mean, just because to make sure that nobody, uh, people are afraid of, of accidents, of when the car will go out of it. Uh, then there are other, other issues that will, why it will take time. There are labor unions. Labor unions are not keen on automating all their jobs, and they have power. Whether it's the teacher union, or it's the can you imagine? And by the way, that's a combination of union and society acceptance. We can solve a lot of crime now with AI. We need a lot less police. I don't see too many cities, state, countries that will say, "Let's kill the police force. Let's do you know ninety percent of the jobs with, with AI." Yeah, it will help. It will help the police, but I don't see downsides. In fact, you add more specialists so they can look at, uh, let's say, financial crime with AI and be more uh, more effective. So we have, and you see, labor union automating the all. We're now in the middle of negotiation between the labor union in the Long Beach LA port and the uh, and the terminal operator. So run them. A lot of it is about Automation, the yeah. union is part automation. And if you look at Long Beach and LA, they're totally unlike, let's say, Dubai or you know Rotterdam or Singapore in terms of automation. They're a lot less efficient, but they use a lot more workers. So it's uh, labor, labor is on the way. And then regulations. Uh, regulation will also be on the way. For example, the Italian government now basically outlaws generative AI, outlaws ChatGPT. The uh, the Chinese government is putting huge guardrails. Now, the Chinese, of course, have a different fear. The fear is that ChatGPT will start saying that maybe the Communist Party is not the best thing since sliced bread. So it's uh, they want to control. And the way they control is very interesting. They control the training data. So yes. you you. you the data, the, the training data is controlled, so you make sure that the results are not going to be something that is less harmonious to the Chinese society. Uh, that's how they uh, they describe it. So, and, and by the way, as in many other things, the Chinese are very effective. They know what they're doing. 
from the understanding that they go to the, well, the European and the American, how do we regulate and all this? Then they, they look how it works and say, that's the part that we should regulate, exactly. I mean, not because once you regulate the training data, you control that. It's, it's you know, it's coming in, it's input and output. They control the input. It's a very clever way of doing it. I, you know, that's how we should do it. <laughs> but, but, uh, but then we get into arguments about freedom of speech. And Democracy and free speech. And yeah. <laughs> privacy and freedom of speech and what people can do. I, okay. But, you know, you have, you have to admire the Chinese government for, for understanding how it works and which part to regulate. Uh, very interesting. Um, so, so there are all these hurdles on the way. So yes, the algorithm, the development is going very fast. Uh, one should also understand that we didn't get to where to chat GPT you know, on one Friday afternoon. We started talking about expert system 50 years ago and they develop and develop and develop until we got to generative uh, AI, which also we needed, of course, the computational power to do it and the data access to do it. So we need the, the internet to, uh, uh, to develop the way it is and the computation power to develop the way it is. And before that, we couldn't really do it. There's another hurdle, just, just to mention, is the computation power. GPT-4 already scanned basically all the written words out there or close to it. It took hundreds of millions of dollars to, to train, to get GPT. Well, and, and there's also, it, it goes right against sustainability uh, initiative because the computational power is using so much energy that uh, people start saying, okay, we get people to write our email, but meanwhile, we're, you know, destroying the world. So maybe, maybe you should think twice about it. So there's, a, I, I'm just saying, yes, the algorithm work fast and, and spread very fast. That these are not the real um, hurdles on the way. One last thing, the companies themselves, that's, that's one of the things that makes me actually very um, positive. You know, when the internet started, we all thought that's great. Everybody will talk to everybody. We'll all love thy neighbor and it should be fine. Nobody talked at, when the internet started, when we, you know, uh, Netscape and all of this. Nobody talked about identity theft. Nobody talked about terrorists, you know, going getting together. On, uh, nobody thought about uh, uh, stealing data and, and privacy issues. No, we didn't think about it. Today, all the company who work on generative AI have huge teams just looking at the safety and trying to make it safe. And you already see the beginning of guardrails. Is they are also calling for what they would like to see. That's amazing from a, such a competitive industry. They're also call, calling for government regulation because they would like to make sure that they compete, but they don't kill the goose that lays the golden, you know, the golden eggs. So they themselves are calling for regulation. Um, we just had a session with the person in, in Google who is the vice president of safety, something like this. I, I don't know the exact, her, her exact title, but she has a whole team that just worries about that. How to make sure that it's safe? How to make sure that it doesn't go awry? How to... So the fact that the companies themselves are worried about all of this is a good sign. Hmm. Yeah. I, as we join, we have 10 more minutes and I want to ask you uh, one question because you've set up five companies in your past and most of it have been tech related and you've, you've sold them, you've fixed some big problems, you've sold them to big corporations. If you were to go at, at from a tech angle again to solve a, a problem right now, what would you do? What would you tackle? What would you solve? Ah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to steal. I'm basically trying to steal your idea, Professor. So tell me, and then I'll yeah, do yeah, it myself. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm you, I, you're right. I had five companies, and after the last one, after we sold the last one, and I tried to think about what next, my wife said. It's either another company or me. There was no, <laughs> no question that she's not going to go ahead with uh, me being both a professor and a CEO of a startup of another company. Uh, because starting a company, especially if you also have a day job, is a full time. I mean, there's no you know, work-life balance. Forget about it. It's, it's just work. 
And, uh, and so my wife had it at one point. And since she was my wife for 54 years, same woman, I look, well, well, well I'll stay with my wife. What the hell? <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> so, so I stay, I, I stay with my wife. But when I talk about one thing that I would not do, start an AI company. Uh, because those right now, there's a gold rush. Every everybody is about to start an AI company. Ninety nine percent of them are going to fail uh, because the VCs who don't know better just pour money in this in this area. And uh, first of all, if you want to compete in this area, why would you choose as your competitor company Google, and Microsoft, and Amazon? I mean, <laughs> these are not big gorillas, these are humongous gorillas and capable and doing stuff. And it's your competitors, maybe you should think twice. That's, that's one. Second, you're yeah, all doing it. It will be hard to distinguish yourself. Yeah, there will be some you know, open AI or successful. That was before we all knew about ChatGPT and all of this. Now, of course, everybody knows about Delhi 2 and ChatGPT and, all the, and, and many others, of course. Uh, so I, I, I would not do it. I would still do the advice that I give everyone. You know, I had five companies and I was with VC boards and all of this. So my students, students all over MIT come to me and come up with uh, ideas. Would I, how do I start a company? How, how do I do it? And, or, or even more, just fix it. What's the best, what's the next best idea to start a company? And my guess is go work for a company, a real company, for a few months, a year, whatever. If you are, if you're not gonna find 50 issues that are don't solve well, that the companies are wasting money, the companies are trapping all over themselves, then you're not looking, you know, deep enough. Big companies come have so many issues, so many problems, and just you will just find it, and then you realize that it's not that company; it's every other company have the same issue. So. Start with the problem, not with the solution. That's why I say I will not start an AI company. Let's start, or, or a blockchain company, or a, a, anyone. Start with an, what it is that you are trying to solve. Okay, companies trying to solve visibility. Companies are trying to solve, you know, network redesign. Companies. And this, I'm just talking about uh, they are existing already startup working in, uh, in all of this area. So I, I must admit I don't have. Uh, a golden bullet to you, a silver bullet, I would just look, start absolutely with a problem, not with a solution. That's my you know, wise word for today. <laughs> when when all you have is a hammer, the world is a nail, no? That, that's what exactly. they... <laughs> start, start, looking at, start looking at where the nails should go and then look if hammer is the right thing or you can do it with your, with your fist, just hammer it. <laughs> Love it. Now, the last the last questions, I, I want to, to poke you a little bit in the direction of education. And, and you mentioned, you know, your, your, your granddaughter, you're a professor of MIT. We've had these discussions before. How do you see education progressing? I mean, we, we, we are actually, if we think super positive, we are at the cusp of, of a revolution where we could have individualized student oh, God, education. Yes. yes, yes, yes. But what you have is exactly what you had the two issues that I mentioned are in the way, unfortunately. One of them is university professors. They don't want to lose their job. Yeah. <laughs> another, thing, another thing is, you know, for state universities, governments don't want to be the government that the opposition will say, ruin the future of our society because they close university. They, they are, uh, um, and then there's what I said, society's acceptance. You know, my son got a degree from ChatGPT. Doesn't sound like as good as my son got a degree from University of Minneapolis or the University of Minnesota or, or, or whatever. Uh, so there's all, all these issues exist in education, but that's where you're absolutely right. And we see what happened. At the end, it will be the private sector who will lead. Because you saw, for example, with online education, yes, universities are doing it and our program is very successful here at MIT. We just said in November, we had our million registrants for our million for our uh, online program. Uh, so we have actually an economic impact. But, um, you know, we saw that uh, 
several other Coursera and, and, and several other private you know, enterprises jumped into the breach because universities are by nature slow. We are very good at preaching flexibility and agility to other. We are the most, the least agile, the least flexible organization, some of the least agile on earth. So we don't move fast. It, it was a huge fight at MIT to start the program that I uh, just mentioned. People thought, oh, you're, you know, diminishing the MIT name. Nonsense. Uh, but this is, uh, this is how, what people feel. So I think the, the private sector will jump in. There will be programs that, that and, and you start thinking about it. What areas can, say, I'm just mentioning, I have no knowledge on this. What area can Google get into? They already get into um, the medical field. They already get into, start to work in hospital and all this. What other big industries are there? Well, the other huge one is education. It's a huge industry. Both millions of people, millions of workers. I think that uh, it's getting, it's bloated, it's inefficient. It's uh, many ways teaches the wrong thing. The product doesn't live up to, to the money that you pay for it. So I would say that it will be private enterprise that will come. You see things like the Khan Academy. It's all Khan yes. Academy that started. Uh, private sector, whether it will be done as charity, whether it will be done as a, you know, for profit, but private sector will come in and say, we will give you AI infused education that um, it will discover, will give you questions, discover what you're good at and give you just, teach you just the right of level that stretches you, but doesn't kill you. Uh, of, of question of all the, the rate that we teach and all this, I think it will it will take a while to develop it because this needs real development. But the tools are already there, so trying to look. We are we ourselves in our program at MIT the the, the online it's called MicroMaster. You, you get you get a certificate and one, one semester worth worth of MIT work. We use a lot of AI internally. Because we are trying to predict when will people drop off the course, when people take it to take five courses, and it's a difficult. And people take it, you know, at night and, and weekends and while they work. So it's, it's tough. So we have, but we have all the data. We have, I don't know, hundreds of millions of because every click is being recorded, every click online is being recorded. So we know exactly. So we use a lot of machine learning to try to see to try to see the, the warning sign when people are going to drop off and need intervention. Now we don't have yet the automatic intervention, but we already can identify when people are kind of start to look iffy and we start to say, okay, let's somebody get talk to them, then you know interview them, what's going on and I, all this. So it's already used to diagnose a problem, not yet to solve it. Uh, but it's already, so some of it is already in use. Anyway, long answer to short yes. question. <laughs> no, but it's like, as always with, with you, Professor, I've given you this feedback before. I love your, you know, your candor and your openness. And um, and I, I think most people are, are either oblivious or afraid or will will fight, you know, like we've, we've always fought against and you had a couple of examples whenever there was a new thing that we fought against it. So um, it's it's always great to hear your perspective. With with this, I will approach the end to our interview. I will want, uh, I mean, of course, we could go on for hours, and it would be my pleasure. But I'm mindful of your time. Again, I will would encourage everybody to look up the book. It's it's an amazing read. Um, um, Professor Sheffi, as I as I shared, as you've seen, is is just um, what a great mind. Professor, thanks for for joining us. As always, it's been a it's been a pleasure, and keep keep inspiring people. Thank you very much, Radu. My pleasure talking with you and, and the audience. Thank you very much for joining.